Good afternoon. Um, I'm Dan Brissett. I'm the Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here today. Um, co-sponsored, today's briefing is co-sponsored uh, with our friends at the Center for Climate and Security and presented in partnership with the Henry M. Jackson Foundation. Thanks to our panelists who represent a tremendous amount of expertise and experience in the nexus where climate change and national security come together. I'm certainly looking forward to hearing them talk about the security threat assessment of climate change as described in their report released today. Uh, many of you hearing me now are following along via our webcast. Thank you for joining us remotely. I don't always call you out, but I know you're there, and thank you very much. Uh, ESI sponsors public briefings on Capitol Hill on a wide range of climate and clean energy topics uh, to help provide policymakers the critical, timely information they need. We happen to maintain a full archive of our briefings at www.esi.org that includes, for example, to stay with today's topic, the September 2019 Climate and National Security Forum, and an overview of military installation resilience from March of last year. Visit us online and take a minute to sign up for our Climate Change Solutions newsletter so our briefing schedule, legislation tracker, fact sheets, and articles are all delivered right to your inbox. This is the point in my introduction when I remember to do this. There, sorry. I always forget to do that. The report that you'll learn about today adds new urgency to the already critical imperative to address climate change. But the report lays out scenarios of what might be, not what will be. The difference is what we do about it. As an organization focused on the United States, today's discussion is a good reminder that when we talk about this, we're talking about global climate change. The actions we take here in the United States matter a lot in terms of our own environment and resilience. But the actions other countries and non-state actors take will affect us too, at home and abroad, in peace, and when conflict breaks out. Reading this report makes it clear to me that we will fare much better if we accept a global perspective when characterizing the threat of climate change and marshalling our resources to address it. Now it is my privilege to introduce the Honorable John Conger, the Director of the Center for Climate and Security. John previously served as the Senior Policy Advisor with the Center, and as the, this is, this is a whole list of titles, and it's very impressive. He said, you don't have to read it. I'm like, no, it's pretty impressive. We're going to read it. And as the Principal Deputy Undersecretary of Defense Comptroller at the U.S. Department of Defense. Before that, John oversaw energy installations and environmental policy. Uh, throughout the Defense Department in different positions as Assistant Secretary of Defense for Energy Installations and Environment, as Acting Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Installations and Environment, and as Assistant Deputy Undersecretary for Defense, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I missed that one, and as Assistant Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Installations in the Environment. John also logged 12 years on Capitol Hill, including with the House International Relations Committee, he has degrees from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and the George Washington <coughs> University. John, on behalf of ESI, thanks for the opportunity to join you today to bring the findings and recommendations of your report to the attention of the public and policymakers and help ensure it informs the work of Congress as it increasingly turns its attention to climate change action. Thank you. All right, how are we all doing today? Good? Monday afternoon, what could be better than to sit down and talk about climate change and how, the, how it's going to impact national security in the years ahead. Um, my name is John Conger, as Dan mentioned. Uh, I'm the director of the Center for Climate and Security. We're, we're a think tank with an advisory board of distinguished retired military and security leaders that's focused squarely on the challenges posed by climate change and to our, uh, cl by climate change to our national security. Uh, CCS is an institute of the Council on Strategic Risks, which is a nonpartisan organization dedicated to anticipating, analyzing, and addressing core systemic risks to security in the 21st century. Thanks to Dan for uh, his introduction and for helping us pull this together. We really uh, have formed a good partnership and done a, a series of events together. Um, and, and, you know, we bring a lot of the, the reports in here and, and Dan's folks are instrumental in being able to, to pull off events on Capitol Hill. And I just appreciate so much uh, your work in this regard. Um, I also wanted to thank uh, the, uh, the office of uh, Chairman Adam Smith of the Armed Services Committee who uh, sponsored this room for us uh, today, uh, without whom we couldn't actually be sitting here talking to you about this. Um, now, I had a couple of introductory sort of uh, scene set of remarks that I wanted to get through. Um, I wrote things down, which is uncharacteristic of me. I normally wing this. Uh, but, but 
but I just wanted to give you a little bit of a sense of why we're talking about climate and security, just to start uh, to give you a little bit of a foundation for the stuff that we're going to be talking about in, in a little bit. Um, so if you're new to the issue, uh, climate change has been recognized as a security issue for many years. Uh, DOD has been thinking about this for a very long time. It's been in worldwide threat assessments since the Bush administration. Um, the, the fact of the matter is, is that uh, widespread, the effects of climate change on stability, on infrastructure, on the Arctic and how it's opening up a whole new ocean, all of these pieces of the puzzle are very important to uh, the security priorities of the country and, and get the focus of the security uh, infrastructure apparatus community. So um, as we think about the big picture and as we bring this all in, it's affecting our security today. All right, uh, you know, we see as uh, hurricanes take down military bases in the Panhandle of Florida or on the coast of North Carolina, have floods impact uh, the bases in Nebraska, uh, wildfires out west. There are impacts to national security across the board already. There is uh, the Syrian civil war I could talk about at length. I'm not going to get into detail, but the fact of the matter is, is that Climate change helps to drive instability. It's not the sole cause of any particular conflict, but it helps to drive that instability and, and serves as a threat multiplier in this context. And so CCS, the Center for Climate and Security, has done reports on this for many years. We've done reports on the impact of sea level rise to the military mission, and last year we published a, uh, a climate security plan for America that outlines dozens of recommendations for the administration, whether it's DOD or the State Department or the intelligence community or the White House, things that one can do to help address this issue. So today, uh, oh, and, and, um, and also a couple of weeks ago in Munich, we released through, uh, we were part of a team that re uh, released the first World Security Report as part of the International Military Council on Climate and Security. So today we, re re we release a security threat assessment of climate change, which is unique in that it looks forward at the projections associated with global temperatures uh, and increases of two degrees and four degrees roughly, um, and ask security experts to evaluate the impacts uh, of these effects. So, so if you think about, we're not the scientists per se. We're sitting there saying, okay, the science community said it. If, if it gets up to two degrees above pre-industrial levels, if it gets up to four degrees uh, above pre-industrial levels, what is the what is the situation? Then we look at what the impacts are and say, all right, what are the security implications of that effect? And that's what this report details. That this report gets into the. We ask the security experts to say, if this happens, then what? And you know, fundamentally, you're going to hear a lot about this, and you're not going to hear me outline all of the details of the report. That's, that's what this panel is going to be here to do. But you're going to hear one inescapable conclusion, that catastrophic climate impacts cause catastrophic security implications. The, the, and the world must find a way to avoid these catastrophic uh, security implications. The, 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 the fact of the matter is, is that while we are not the energy experts or the tax experts or the regulation experts or the innovation experts, we are the security experts and we sit here and say, you've got to avoid this. We are outlining a situation where if you let the situation get to the, uh, to the future of four degree uh, temperature increases, that the security implications are untenable. And so the policymakers across this nation should find a way to avoid that, if at all possible. We're not going to say how. We're not going to. It's not our job to offer the policy solution in that regard. But what what we are looking for is going to put. Um, it, what we are looking for, though, is a uh, it, it is is we're essentially saying. Let's, let's find a way to get to that point. Let's find a way to head that off because the alternative is untenable. All right. So now that I've given sort of the preamble, hopefully you'll hear less from me as we go on. Um, I also did want to recognize the Henry M. Jackson Foundation for helping provide, providing the funding for this effort. And, and we are lucky to have the president of the foundation here um, and and uh, so I wanted to uh, say to Craig Gannett, who's going to be, I'm going to call him up here to speak in just a second. We're pleased to have Greg Gannett, the president of the Henry M. Jackson Foundation, to make some comments here at the outset. Craig is an attorney in Seattle where he focuses on electric utility regulation, renewable energy, and climate change related regulation. Early in his career, 
he actually worked for Senator Jackson through the Senate Committee on Energy and Natural Resources. And now he's, he's going to be here and he's been able to help uh, support our efforts. So let me step aside and invite Craig Gump to speak. Great. I forgot mine. Uh, thank you, John, uh, and thank you for uh, attending this, this important event. Um, for uh, over 35 years, the Henry M. Jackson Foundation has continued the work of Senator Jackson. Um, and two of the matters that he worked on um, uh, that were the uh, two of his highest priorities were protecting the environment and enhancing our national security by, by strengthening our military. Um, and both of those fundamental bedrock policies are jeopardized by climate change. And that's why the foundation for the last six years has focused on the intersection between climate change and national security attempting to bring in some of the military voices who can broaden the, the dialogue. Um, we've also urged that the debate on this topic be conducted in a civil, bipartisan, fact-based manner. Um, this is the way Senator Jackson did business on a whole range of topics, everything he, he worked on, but it's particularly important here. The other uh, thing that Senator Jackson did is he, he uh, loved to rely on seasoned experts in a field. And that makes it even more appropriate that we're here sponsoring a panel of experts in this area. Um, there was a time uh, not so long ago when protecting the environment and national security uh, were bipartisan issues. Uh, for example, Senator Jackson co-sponsored the National Environmental Policy Act of 1969, which was signed by President Richard Nixon. And in urging action on that, I just want to read, Senator Jackson said, Today it is clear we cannot continue to perpetuate the mistakes of the past. We no longer have the margins for error and mistake that we once enjoyed. To date, over a hundred nations have adopted statutes based on the National Environmental Policy Act. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, NEPA requires a hard look at the long-term cumulative impacts of our actions on the environment. This is a topic for a different conversation, but suffice it to say that the proposed rollback of the NEPA regulations that's now ongoing is deeply concerning, particularly as it relates to climate change. I want to um, highlight one key recommendation in the report that's only briefly mentioned, but it's extremely important, and that is that we reach global net zero emissions as soon as possible. For perspective, this is more ambitious than what the nations of the world have so far committed to doing under the Paris Agreement, and it's more than would have been done under all of President Obama's climate change regulations had they been fully implemented. So why recommend that we get to net zero carbon as soon as possible? Because, according to the intergovernmental panel on climate change, the scientists, that gives us a shot at limiting the increased temperature to no more than 1.5 degrees. No, not a certainty by any means, but it gives us a shot. This is not only a, a goal of the Paris Agreement, but it keeps us within the lower temperature range that our experts are going to be discussing and thereby reducing the overall impacts because, spoiler alert, the lower temperature range that you're going to hear discussing, discussed is very bad. But the higher temperature ranges are much, much worse, including catastrophic. 
as John mentioned, the report doesn't attempt to prescribe a regulatory strategy, whether it be cap and trade or a carbon tax or some other approach, um, and it doesn't attempt to, to figure out how we should reduce, we should capture carbon. So there's, in order to get to net zero carbon, you've got to reduce your emissions and then you've got to do some carbon capture. But whether that be done through reforestation or a direct carbon capture or some other technology, all of that is beyond the scope of, of this panel. It's beyond their expertise. But what this report does say is that by whatever means, we must get to zero net emissions as soon as possible in order to prevent the worst effects of climate change and thereby preserve national security. Any further denial or delay will only make the lives of our children and grandchildren less secure. As Senator Jackson put it in 1968, the survival of man in a world in which decency and dignity are possible is the basic reason for bringing man's impacts on his environment under informed and responsible control. A half century later, our failure to bring those impacts under informed and responsible control is jeopardizing our national security. We still have time to limit the harm, but our margin for error and mistake is shrinking fast. So for all these reasons, the Henry M. Jackson Foundation is pleased to partner with the Center for Climate and Security and the EESI on this important program. And with that, I'll turn it back to John. All right, so now I want to get into the meat of the report, and, that, and that's going to be our panel. It's fitting that we have a panel of folks to talk about the report, because really we had a panel of folks put together the report. In fact, we had uh, a group, and we get no points for acronyms on this one, but we had a, 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 a natu National Security, Military, and Intelligence Panel, NISMIP. Now, you know, normally you'd think, try and figure out a word that goes along with, but no, no, it's fine. So anyway, we had, we had this group, this panel, that put together the report of security experts, and you'll find it in the, in the front of the report. And we have several of them here today. Uh, they're each going to talk about different aspects of the findings, uh, but fundamentally, once again, they, they were there to analyze what's going to happen to different parts of the world and to the security of the world based on the scientific results that were an input to this report. What happens at two degrees? What happens at four degrees? And then what happens, you know, from those physical implications? You know, what happens when, uh, you know, you have parts of the world that become unlivable? What happens when water stress becomes too, too severe, et cetera, et cetera? So I'm go what I'm going to do next is introduce the panel all at once rather than introduce them all as they come up to talk. So I'm going to go through some bio here. And then once we're done with that, I'm going to invite each one in turn to come up. And we're going to talk. I'm not Craig Gannett, by the way. Hold on a second. I'm going to learn. By the, by the end of this session, I'm going to learn how to do this. So the videographers, normally I have everybody sit at the table and stay at the table. But the, the bit, for the video, we're going to have everybody come up sort of to the podium as they give their introductory uh, remarks. And then uh, we'll, we'll take questions and answers from the table. So uh, just so you know how this is going to flow. Uh, also, I appreciate everybody's forbearance. The temperature in here is getting pretty warm. Uh, I don't think that's supposed to be symbolic of anything. Um, but we've got a pretty, good, pretty full room, which I appreciate uh, just dealing with the, uh, the heat. Um, so anyway, now we're going uh, to have the panel. Let me do the introductions. First, we're going to he hear from Kate Guy. Uh, Kate is a senior fellow at the Center uh, for Climate and Security and was the principal investigator for this report. Uh, she led a panel, we call, yeah, I just went through this, we called the National Security, Military, and Intelligence Panel, but if I keep repeating it, you're going to remember what it was. Um, and and uh, that was a group of 15 national security experts that is responsible for this effort. 
Uh, she's currently pursuing a PhD in international relations at the University of Oxford. Uh, she flew in for this, uh, where she researches the intersection of climate change, national security, and global governance. Second, we'll hear from Dr. Rod Schoonover. Rod is a member of the Center uh, for Climate and Security's Advisory Board. Uh, Dr. Schoonover uh, is the founder and CEO of the Ecological Futures Group, which focuses on the security implications of global ecological disruption and climate change. And he is an adjunct professor at uh, Georgetown University School of Foreign Service. He served for a decade in the U.S. intelligence community as a senior analyst and senior scientist in the Bureau of Intelligence and Research at the U.S. Department of State and as the Director of Environment and Natural Resources at the National Intelligence Council. Um, then we're gonna hear from Sherry Goodman. If there is a single central figure at the intersection of climate change and national security, it's Sherry. Uh, she is the Chair of the Council on Strategic Risks, our parent organization. Uh, she is the Secretary General of the International Military Council on Climate and Security. She's a Senior Strategist at the Center for Climate and Security and a member of our advisory board. Uh, but I won't read her entire biography, uh, but I did want to point out that she is also a senior fellow at the Wilson Center and has served as CEO and president of the Ocean Leadership, Leadership Consortium and senior vice president, general counsel, and corporate secretary at the Center for Naval Analyses. Uh, she was also a deputy undersecretary of defense for environmental security. Um, last but not least is former ambassador uh, Richard uh, Kozlarich. Uh, Rich is a regular member of our climate security working group and is, is currently a distinguished visiting professor at George Mason University, as well as co-director uh, of, of its Center for Energy Science and Policy. He has had a long career in diplomatic and intelligence circles, including serving as National Intelligence Officer for Europe on the National Intelligence Council and Ambassador to Azerbaijan from 1994 to 1997 and to Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, from 1997 to 1999. Each of these speakers, uh, like I said, was a member of the panel that crafted this report and will speak to the issues we considered and the assessments we made. Uh, Kate is going to go first and present the scope and conclusions of the report. Kate. Bring your thing up. Great. Thank you, John. Thank you, Craig. Thank you, ESI. I won't go on with all the acknowledgments, but there are many uh, because, as you can see, looking at this report, it's long <laughs> and it's hefty, which meant that we, um, as a panel and as an organization, relied on many incredible inputs to, to form the basis of this analysis and months of work to uh, get it to this point. So a hearty thanks to the incredible people. This is just a small sample of the expertise that we work together um, to write the report that's in front of you. And I think it really shows um, just the caliber of folks we had weighing in um, on this report. So what are we looking at here? Um, both Craig and John gave a really good um, framing as to why we thought this was an important um, analysis to do. But just to uh, give you a bit of background of what this threat assessment is and, and where it falls into the current conversation of climate insecurity, um, these 15 uh, panelists have truly spent their lives uh, analyzing threats to American interests, to American livelihoods, to global security, um, and generally doing so uh, without public knowledge of those efforts, right? Um, and so the people in front of you today have compiled many of those threat assessments for a variety of issues, everything from conflict to terrorism to nuclear war. Um, and this panel together now in you know, different parts of their lives all collectively identified climate change as one of those issues that um, was a unique one, I suppose, from a threat assessment perspective. So when we brought the panel together, it was clear that this uniqueness meant that we needed to do something a little bit different as we were um, thinking about how to assess these threats for a public audience. So the reason why climate change is a, a different threat um, is in part because of what John said. Um, it is a threat multiplier. Um, this is a term that Sherry helped coin, but it's one that is so evocative that it, it bears repeating, which is that every threat that we are currently facing, and we meaning Americans and, and frankly humans around the world, are, are going to get worse or going to get exacerbated or going to get more dangerous, more unstable uh, because of the natural and social effects of climate change as it intensifies uh, across the century if we let it. 
But the other reason that climate change is an interesting threat is because we, in a way, know more about it um, than any threat we ever have faced before. And this is because we have decades at this point of incredibly sophisticated and vetted climate and natural system science um, through, through the IPCC and through uh, researchers at universities across the world who've been collaborating to say, okay, what might happen if we let temperatures rise to certain levels? And that's not just, you know, how much will sea levels rise, that's also how to those climate systems, those environmental systems, those weather systems interact with social um, stability, interact with our food systems, our economic systems, our political systems. And increasingly, you have researchers across the world that are putting these issues together. So from the security perspective, we had a, a great basis to go on. What we didn't have was that compiled in any comprehensive way uh, for us. Uh, so together as a panel, we set about um, doing a, a thorough analysis uh, for each region of the world. Um, and we classify, uh, categorize that under the U.S. combatant commands. So if you're curious about one region or another, you can flip to that part of the report um, and focus in depth on that. Or you can, uh, you know, spend an afternoon uh, diving into the depressing reality that is the entire world together. That's up to you. Um, but in looking at these, each region of the world, we decided, as, as John uh, alluded to, to look at it under two different scenarios. And this is because the panel very quickly realized that not all climate change is the same. Um, and different scenarios of warming mean different security impacts. Um, and so because of that, we, we um, classified our work into two scenarios of warming. The first is a near-term a uh, relatively near-term scenario in which the temperature rises by mid-century by about two degrees centigrade, which for the Americans um, in the room is about um, three and a half degrees Fahrenheit. Um, in the second scenario, uh, which is more of a medium to long-term scenario, so between 2015 and about the end of the century, which is quite long-term for security community to, to look at the effects of, um, is about four degrees warming or higher, which is about 7.2 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and the or higher aspect on that is because we don't know enough about tipping points. We don't know enough about um, hidden emissions in, in permafrost in other areas that it might be more than four uh, degrees centigrade of warming by the end of the century, again, if we let it. Um, and just to put these numbers into context, because I think they seem innocuous, uh, remember we have uh, allowed the temperatures to rise globally by about one degree centigrade thus far from pre-industrial levels. Um, and if we continue on with you know, implementing the policies that we have in place, uh, the latest science says we will probably reach about 3.2 or 3.2 degrees centigrade, um, 5.8 degrees Fahrenheit by the end of this century. Um, and that could be anywhere on a range of about two and a half to four degrees. So that lower end, um, higher end, warming scenario, which is in the report, is what we are currently on track for. And I think that's important to highlight again and again. If we change nothing about what we do, that catastrophic scenario, which seems so far off and so um, distant, is what science says we're in store for. Okay, so that's the, the framing of the report. Now, what do, did we find? Um, so we analyse, uh, uh, did an analysis of those scenarios of warming. We compiled the, the great IPCC literature that's out there, um, more recent scientific literature into you know, how these effects actually uh, come into contact with societies in each region, and assessed those security threats um, as they evolve to security environments, security institutions, and security infrastructure. Uh, so recognizing that security threats take different forms, uh, we decided to look at how those, you know, evolve in different, in different areas. Um, and from that assessment, uh, tried to do a categorization of what is the level of risk. Now, uh, John's kind of stolen my thunder on this a little bit. It's, it's not pretty. Um, and the, one of the main findings of the report, which um, we, we had a hankering to think it might go this way, but I think it was, it was very clear when we uh, looked at the security environment and the scenarios that we laid out, that even at a low near-term um, level of warming, the, the threats and the impacts are very, very severe. Um, it's different in different regions of the world, but no region of the world is um, unimpacted, even at low levels of warming near-term scenarios. And when you start looking into that end-of-century warming, uh, trajectories, things get 
you know, out of control. They, they spiral as our societies, as these impacts um, mount and mount, um, and our institutions, specifically our security institutions, become unable and under-resourced to handle them, which is what we would expect um, current security communities to, to face um, under their scenarios of warming. So I encourage you to to dig into the detail of the report to see how issues you care about or regions you care about um, are likely to be affected, recognizing that none of this is prediction. This is not saying this is what will happen. It's saying based on the best science and the best expertise of the panelists, this is what is likely to happen. Um, and I want to, to pull out another element, which is this only happens if we let it. Um, and we, as a security community, as uh, the panel of this report, think there is nothing more convincing than reading this report to, to recommend swift action. And that action is uh, for society at large, for the world, but also for the security community itself to take these threats very seriously. So the three main recommendations of the report uh, the first has been mentioned to achieve net zero global emissions as soon as possible. An important caveat, I think, to that is that we do so in a way that is ambitious, of course, but also safe, equitable, and well-governed, because if uh, our approach to achieve net zero emissions is not those things as well, that could also lead to unintended security consequences, um, meaning you know, geoengineering technologies or those kind of things. So we want to make sure that that path that we choose is also a secure path uh, to lower our emissions. But then also as a, a security community, we need to start taking these threats much more seriously than we have so far. Um, so we need to rapidly build resilience to the impacts that are already here, uh, to the impacts that are soon to come if we follow along these trajectories, and really climate-proof all of these environments, institutions, and infrastructure that we outline in the report. And climate-proof means um, being future-oriented in the way those are designed. And finally, our last recommendation is um, that we prioritize, communicate, and respond to these threats as we track them. Uh, this is a bipartisan issue. This is a national security issue. And if we are not prioritizing the effects at that level, um, we're not doing our due diligence as a security community, as a policymaking community, et cetera. So I'm going to stop there and let the, the next three panelists dive into some of the scary details. Um, but Thank you so much uh, for, for being here. And please do uh, have a look through the report. There's a lot of uh, important things in there, whatever your background. So thanks, thanks very much. Thanks, Kate. Rod. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks to the hosts. Uh, for inviting me to the panel. Thanks to the audience for coming. Um, thanks to Kate for spearheading what I think is really an incredible report. And just, uh, I've been asked to talk about the science and intelligence piece of this. Uh, but before I start, let's just make certain we understand. This is a very serious situation. Uh, from a security standpoint, from a humanitarian issue standpoint, um, we're really in an ecological predicament. And we, we really need to take on board uh, the serious, seriousness of uh, the, the situation before us. So one of the questions is, so I spent a decade in the intelligence community, the, uh, the underbelly of the US government, um, proudly. And one of the questions that I was asked to uh, speak to is really how do you take a, a complex and um, uncertain threat like climate change, how do you take the science and draw security uh, outcomes from it? And so this is what I did for, uh, for a long time in the intelligence community. One of the things that's important one of the things that the IPCC report uh, endeavors to do is project the future. But we in the security community are not trying to do that, as was mentioned uh, in the tee-off comments. We are trying to assess risk and, uh, and write a threat assessment. And so what you, a, a, a good way to do that is through the development of scenarios. Uh, one scenario leads to this outcome, another scenario leads to out, 
another outcome. And what this does is helps the policymaker imagine and visualize different futures um, and, and makes that, those worlds, those futures, real for them. I think that's really a powerful thing that, that scenario work does, and scenarios uh, were something that we did quite a bit in the intelligence community. But when you're looking at climate change, what you have to do to really think about the threat is look at all the different parts of the natural system that are affected by climate change. And so what that meant for me as an intelligence analyst is to read beyond the summary from poly policymakers and get into those thick, uh, you know, several thousand page reports. Uh, because that's, as everyone knows, that's where all the good stuff is. Um, and dig through the science. What is the science saying? Not original science, what are the scientists saying in the IPCC reports? So what phenomena are changing from climate change? That's step one. And there's a lot. There's sea level rise, but there's also impacts on agricultural pests and uh, ocean acidification and jellyfish, all kinds of things at the same time. Um, and so then you take it a step further. What are the effects of these changes on people and nations? And then you take it a step further. What are the security, possible security outcomes for those changes? So that's an audit trail of how you get from science to security. Um, so, so one of the things that's important to recognize, I think most of us know this, but you have to say it from the very beginning, is that the natural world has been influenced and stressed by direct anthropogenic action before the effects of climate change have ever uh, come. So, for example, substantial changes to habitat, uh, deforestation, overgrazing, overfishing, uh, overfarming, imbalance in biogeochemicals like nitrogen and uh, phosphorus and direct, direct exploitation of organisms. One of the reasons why it's important to say that is when you look at those temperature plots, that's just temperature, as if there's nothing else happening in the world. But, the, but these effects fall on a natural system that is already um, stressed. So just talking about uh, greenhouse gas emissions leads to two major pulses that I think everyone's aware of. There's atmospheric warming, which is, does not stay in the atmosphere. It goes into the ocean uh, throughout the hydrosphere and to the biosphere. And also ocean acidification from uh, the uh, dissolving of CO2. These are both pulses in their different, um, in their different systems that are, have several knock-on effects. The, uh, and, and we talk about many security outcomes that are possible. So, for example, I study political instability quite a bit. Political instability and social discohesion. It's a good thing to, to focus on because it, it, the arguments can be made for human migration as well, uh, unrest, uh, et cetera. Um, so political instability, social discohesion, amplification of grievances, and uh, widening of ungoverned spaces. So ungoverned spaces used to be something that the security community cared deeply about. Uh, we're kind of in a, a return to great power dynamics uh, currently. But those ungoverned spaces are a great um, petri dish for what are called public bads the opposite of public goods, public bads. So things like crime, terrorism, disease, often come out of these ungoverned spaces. And ungoverned spaces come along with political instability. Um, so countries with weak institutions, low governmental legitimacy, or potential for conflict, or actual conflict already exists, uh, these places have increased risk of instability. And so for the intelligence community, uh, not just the United States intelligence community, but the intelligence communities worldwide, 
I think there is a, a challenge, an uh, ongoing challenge, in how to bring in uh, the uh, disparate effects of climate change, in addition to really gaining uh, a handle on second and third order effects, uh, which I think are very difficult uh, to ferret out. Um, I think especially those effects that are not easily modeled by computers, right? Uh, in, in a lot of cases, I say this as a physicist here, a lot of the, um, a lot of the easy work has been done by, by the physicists because there are equations and, and uh, partial differential equations to be solved and we can give you good uh, temperature and humidity graphs. But the hard work are those things that are not easily modeled, like what is the effect on this biological system? What is the effect on this particular disease? What is this effect on mass psychology or sociology? Those are hard. Um, but because it's hard, we, that means we have to redouble or retriple our efforts to understand those connections. Um, inside of the intelligence community, one of the things that I was uh, happiest about was strengthening the science and security uh, um, discussion. It's a discussion, ongoing discussion between security experts and the people who do first, uh, first line scientific research. One of the things that we have to do when we think about all the different ways that climate change is affecting the natural world, we have to bring in some of the non-traditional scientists to uh, have these discussions. A lot of these are represented in the report, um, but going forward, ecologists, epidemiologists, social scientists, psychologists um, probably help us better understand what the effects of climate change will be. And I also think, just returning to the scenario work, I think a lot more work can be done and, uh, and I think this report goes a long ways towards imagining a world where little or no action is, uh, is taken. What are, the, what are the security effects um, of doing nothing? I think that is something that uh, really needs to be communicated more fulsomely um, to policymakers. And my time is up. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sherry, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you all today. First, I, I want to thank Dan and the great EESI team. I've worked with you all since Carol was your, your leader and over a number of decades now, and you've done great work to elevate attention to environmental and energy issues on the Hill. So thank you. It's a, it's a great, great public service. Uh, I also want to thank the great team at the Center for Climate and Security and the Council on Strategic Risk, Frank and Caitlin, the co-founders. You guys have just done marvelous work and great leadership. Uh, and John, you really bring it all home. I see one of our team there in the back, Steve Brock, there may be others. The person who really gets the, the kudos and is the great star of this report is Kate. So she is a, really a, a leader in this field now and brought this all together, and so I want to really give my, my hats off to you, Kate. Great, great work. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be here with my colleagues, uh, Rod and Rich. I always learn something new from you. Thank you very much for your years of, of public service and dedication. And Craig, you know, thank you, Craig Gannett and the Jackson Foundation, you all. We wouldn't be here without you. You have been instrumental in this field, and as you described, uh, you know, your first boss, uh, Senator Scoop Jackson, uh, he, he cared most about national security and environmental security, our defense and our conservation, and that's really come together in the climate security field. You worked for Scoop in the same era when I worked for Senator Nunn on the Senate Armed Services Committee, 
uh, many years ago. And to many of you who are here in the room today, maybe you're young staffers on, or, or staffers on committees or, want, or serve in the executive branch or in think tanks, and I, I've been in all of those realms, and so I'm going to direct my remarks today in a way that I hope is about how you all can make a difference, because what you do actually really matters, okay? And how you use this and this report matters. So I've got a few, I couldn't help myself, I had to have a few slides, okay? So I want to start, it's, it's a bit of a history lesson now, uh, although we're all really young at heart and the chairman and the founder, first chairman of our military advisory board is here, General Gordon Sullivan, uh, former chief of staff of the United States Army, who really brought the Army uh, through the Cold War period into today. And so he, and I, he served uh, as our first chairman when we issued really the first report um, on climate change as a national security threat in 2007. Climate change and the threat of national security. Now, um, this was, like this report, scientifically sound research with actionable ideas. And it was in that report that we coined the phrase threat multiplier. Climate change as a threat multiplier for instability in fragile regions of the world. We issued that report uh, in April of 2007. Okay, that's almost 14 years ago now. And um, that, in that report, the week after that report was issued, the very first recommendation of that report was enacted on the defense authorization bill by the Senate Armed Services Committee in the markup of that bill, by, jointly sponsored by Sen then Senator um, John Warner of Virginia and uh, Hillary Clinton, Senator Clinton at the time. And it was included, you know, you know in, and it required that the Department of Defense and the intelligence community address the national security implications of climate change in all their key reports from the national defense strategy, the national president's national security strategy, an important document called the Quadrennial Defense Review, um, as well as a national intelligence assessment produced by the national intelligence, by the intelligence community. And that, as you see, has led to, and these are just a sampling of the many documents that have been produced since 2008 that have included an assessment of climate impacts on security. And I think that's very important because then you see how you can take reports like this and others and convert the recommendations into provisions that can be included in bills that then direct the government to do something that is meaningful. Now, I take all those, those documents are all important. They're important guidance. I see many people in the room, my colleagues from DOD and elsewhere and other parts who are actually working and have been working on implementing that. And that has been incredibly important. And here you can see uh, some of the statements made by, by senior leaders. Um, in uh, both former Secretary of Defense uh, Mattis and uh, chair, former Chairman Joe Dunford in this administration about the importance of climate, uh, of climate impacts, reflects their understanding, not necessarily of all the details that Kate and this report present here today, but an understanding of the threat multiplier impact of climate change. Now, we sometimes say, Unfortunately, that strategy without resources is hallucination. So um, this is all good. We still need to resource a lot of what we've been talking about here. So uh, as we look to the future, and I want to be mindful of time, so I'm really going to go fast here. I'm going to just tell one story here about uh, you know, a scenario. And I'm going to pick the Arctic. I know we have got some Arctic experts here in this room as well. Um, so the Arctic, um, you know, is an area where we are now seeing geopolitical competition emerge because of the changing climate, okay? Because the uh, sea ice, long-term sea ice is retreating, the permafrost is collapsing, uh, the ocean temperatures are rising. And because of that, some say there's a race for resources. 
uh, to extract uh, the, the fossil fuels that are there, the minerals. China has um, got its Polar Silk Road strategy where it hopes to shorten shipping times from Shanghai to Hamburg and see that as part of its longer Belt and Road Initiative. Russia is remilitarizing in the Arctic, uh, and we may see the next hybrid warfare gray zone conflict emerge in the high north. And we in the U.S. are now just building uh, our first next generation icebreaker. Uh, we need, we're building one, we have a plan to build three, we probably need quite a bit more and much more other capability as well. Um, so we took a look at uh, uh, a future, okay? What would the future bring under various warming scenarios? We did this scenario, a scenario, mini sort of tabletop demonstration exercise, looking at a nuclear shipping incident in the Bering Strait where Russia and the U.S. are only 30 miles apart at their closest point in 2050 uh, when the sea ice, and these are various, you can see projected sea ice decline and 21st century shipping routes opening up at various time frames here on the right side. And we looked at a potential Russian nuclear icebreaker uh, colliding with the Chinese LNG vessel it's escorting through the Bering Strait. And what do we need, if that could happen in 2050, what do we need to understand now to prepare for that potential future that we hope very much to avoid? So that we did, uh, and that's up actually, you can find the, the report on that on the CSR uh, website. It was part of Arctic Futures 2050, done with the National Academy of Sciences and Sandia Labs uh, back last September. Okay, so um, what does this all amount to? It amounts to we really need to climate-proof our future. Climate-proof, that's the theme. And here are the ways these were um, included. These are actually recommendations from a, uh, the Climate Security Plan for America, which uh, CCS released. Uh, last year, they are in many ways parallel some of the recommendations in this report. The net zero emissions goal is, is in fact hugely uh, ambitious, but you know what? Um, the Army has had a goal to be net zero um, in its bases, and that's been very important because I want to say that in my experience serving both on the Senate Armed Services Committee and eight years as a Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Environmental Security in an era where DOD really went from being seen as an environmental laggard to being seen as an environmental leader, that DOD can lead by example because it is on the front lines of climate threats and, and because it is a large energy user. And our military has led by example in so many other critical areas of our life over many generations, whether it's on social issues from integration of a variety of types, or whether it's in technology issues, in sort of developing the next generation of technology that's led us into have the um, innovation prowess and the the domain awareness and the merit and the dominance that we expect from our own country. And so, to me, there's no reason we shouldn't be leading in this area particularly as it relates to building climate resilience for the future, whether it's our bases or our communities, and also better integrating our understanding of climate security uh, across, uh, across the board. So we can't wait, we shouldn't wait, as General Sullivan and I said in an article last year, we should not wait for the next 9-11 or the next Pearl Harbor before we begin to act. We need to act now you all are the next-gen leaders in this field. I hope you will take up the recommendations of this report and put them into action. Thank you. Good evening. I'm, I'm not going to put up PowerPoint slides since I got to teach a class at 7.30 at George Mason and I've got all my slides tied up there. So that 
won't be available for this. But, but thank you very much for including me. Kate, this is just such a terrific piece of work, and, and I, I'm not going to repeat anything that anyone else has said about how, how much effort you put into making this a, a real success. But thank, thank you very much. And to those who've supported the work, uh, it's, it's good. It's very good. Um, Last Thursday, I was at George Washington University, and Skip Ganim, who's a former colleague of mine, uh, senior State Department official, was ambassador in Kuwait, now is in the Middle East Institute there at, at George, uh, George Washington. And he gave a speech about U.S. policy in the Persian Gulf. And he used the analogy of being in a ship in the middle of this horrible storm with a very experienced crew and no captain. And there are times, as a former diplomat, when I look at U.S. policy as it relates to the things that we're talking about and the, um, the report talks about, um, that it's really hard to fall back on past experience, what previous administrations did or didn't do to be able to predict what is going to be the response of this particular administration facing these challenges um, that, uh, that we all recognize? And I just kind of make an assumption in all of this that the Trump administration is, has, for whatever reason, determined it's not going to deploy you know, diplomatic intelligence and military re resources to deal with this crisis um, as these challenges relate to, to climate. And so it's kind of hard to me, for me as a former diplomat to kind of say, well, this is what we did during the Bush administration or the Obama administration, what we can do now. Um, and, and so I, I start with this very uneasy position of, of not being able to draw on, on that kind of experience to be able to say what are the policy steps that can, can be taken, at least in the short run. You know, for 32 years in the State Department, in Africa, in the Middle East, the former Soviet Union, you know, we were always sort of focused on two things. How do you help countries develop so that they can achieve a level of economic uh, stability uh, and prosperity so that they are more stable? And the second thing was, when you end up in a situation like Bosnia, how do you build resilient societies coming out of a, a, out of a civil war? Uh, and and I, you know, I think that the game has changed uh, as we deal with these issues. And as I read the report, uh, Kate, you know, I, I keep coming back to the things that weren't, weren't addressed, not because the report wasn't done well, but because they raised questions in my mind and, and I'm thinking here in, in particular of the, the situation in Africa, not so much, it's clear what will happen if we don't do uh, something about the climate impact of, of these security challenges. But I worry about what do we do, what happens if we do do something? Uh, you know, there are a billion people around the world who don't have electricity. And Kate hinted at this, you know, there, there are these collateral effects. If we do take steps under you know, the current situation, how do these people achieve their goal of just having electricity to, uh, to live uh, under, under these circumstances? Um, the second thing I was, I was thinking about, too, and it's in Africa and countries like uh, Azerbaijan, where you have Mozambique, Angola, um, oil and gas producers, which now suddenly are left with stranded assets and no way of achieving that growth that we thought was so important for their, for their future development. And then the security challenges that are created as we shift from a carbon-based uh, energy system to one that is more renewable-based, uh, the whole question of rare earth minerals, cobalt, lithium, now suddenly the Democratic Republic of the Congo, which when I joined the Foreign Service we were worried about for copper, <laughs> now we're worried about for cobalt. So there's a, there's a whole lot of changes that are, that are going on that are going to create or intens intensify security threats because we do, do begin to act. Um, I really like the way this report looked at the problem based on combatant commands. It's a much more manageable way 
of trying to decide if we reach the point where we're trying to do something policy-wise, how to do it. The thing I came away with, we can't expect the military to do all this. I mean, it just, it just isn't going to be enough. I mean, we do need diplomacy. We knew, do need USAID. We need, we need international partners if, if we're going to have, have any success, uh, excess, success at all. And I think we do have to be concerned if we are uh, interested in national security about the impact of diverting resources to do with, deal with many of these challenges that are so clearly laid out in the report that takes away the co combatant commanders and their, their resources from the mission they're, they're there to do. And I think that has to be a real, uh, a real important issue. We have to spend more time working on individual countries and developing uh, the capacity to cope with migration issues and to adapt to climate change, uh, particularly in, in countries like, uh, um, like uh, the ones in Africa. One specific issue which I, I think is worth thinking about uh, because it, it kind of runs counter to what I started with um, is the new Renaissance Dam project in Ethiopia. And here, this was identified in your, your report, too, I think, is one of the African challenges of access to water resources. The Trump administration, for whatever reason, has decided they're going to help mediate between Egypt and, and Ethiopia in resolving the, the conflict, which is, which is obviously there, partially caused by, by climate. Here's an opportunity, in fact, to make progress on an issue that may not directly take on the climate causes of the conflict, but do allow us, the United States, to begin to play a role on some of these, these crises which are largely but not entirely, entirely climate-based. So um, on the one hand, I'm pessimistic. On the other hand, I think there are opportunities where even uh, we can in this, uh, this administration take some steps that really do address the issues that this report has so clearly laid out. Thank you. All right, for the, for the next part of our program, we're, uh, we're going to do this from the table, and we're going to do a couple of uh, questions and answers. You know, I, I will say that my instinct was to do most of the questions from the room, but I'm going to take moderator's prerogative and hit a couple points that I think um, weren't necessarily covered in this discussion. So let me, let me throw this one out there. We talked a lot about how the future will be catastrophic, but we didn't actually share with you what's the catastrophic outcome. What is the, what are we afraid of? So if I could ask the panel to talk a little bit, um, it, give an example. You don't have to go into, into great detail because we only have a little bit of time. But t tell me something from the, from the report, some, one of the discussions of something at the higher degree scenarios that could be avoided that really scares you. I'm going to discuss. Whoever wants to go. Rich, go ahead. I think what scares me, because I read the newspapers today, I still read newspapers, by the way, um, about the pandemic, is the intersection of these climate-caused crises, including the public health dimension, with a unpredictable wild card pan, you know, a global, global issue that makes, makes these things even worse. And you end up with a complex system of responses that we're not prepared for. Okay, Sherry, you want to give an example? Well, I think the one I used is, is one that keeps me up at night, you know, of a nuclear shipping, uh, a nuclear scenario in the Arctic. We know that, that Russia doesn't have the best nuclear safety record from Chernobyl to the Kursk submarine, and as we increasingly nuclearize. Now, I, I just want to be very clear. I do think nuclear safe nuclear power has to be part of our clean energy future. Uh, but I am worried about over-militarization by, uns by, by uh, those who don't have a record of good nuclear safety operations. And uh, particularly if you, if you look at, um, you know, the, the um, potential sort of black swan incidents or the, the tipping points of a Greenland ice sheet break, uh, uh, 
collapsing or parts of Antarctica breaking off, and then you have global sea levels rising much more rapidly within a matter of a couple of decades. Uh, that combined with the likely, you know, possibility of these increased incidents, you also have many parts of the planet, including our own country, you know, major cities and coastal areas becoming uninhabitable because of increasingly rapid sea level rise, coastal erosion, and uh, storm surge from extreme weather events. Rod. I'll add another one to the pessimistic uh, um, uh, conversation. I'll, both of those are wonderful uh, examples of terrible things that can happen. Um, I hope you're going to end on a positive note here, though, John. No chance. Um, <laughs> then we're giving it to Jerusalem. Uh, I will return to the issue I brought up uh, at the podium, and that's political instability. Um, so when you look at the effects of climate change and climate change effect, climate change linked effects on labor, on agriculture, on fisheries, on insurance, on uh, public health, you start to paint a picture of uh, real serious impacts on not just the vulnerable, uh, the vulnerable and the unlucky, um, and that the, the people affected in that, uh, you know, in that Venn diagram grows with time. And so we are, are already seeing pockets of instability uh, in, in Africa, in the Middle East. Um, climate effects and climate linked effects will uh, likely add to the list of if we don't call them outright state failures, we'll probably talk about them as fragile states uh, at least. But we're adding to the, almost certainly adding to that list of fragile and, and failed states. But also the countries that are already uh, struggling, climate has an effect on keeping them from recovering. And so we've invested a lot of uh, U.S. and Western resources in places like Iraq and Afghanistan, and climate change may be a press that keeps these countries from fully recovering. And so the United States does best when there are pockets of stability, when, when not more than pockets, when the world is stable. That, that is the arena in which the United States and its values do best. And so we're really looking at uh, um, a, a bleak future if we see more and more countries become <coughs> fragile. All right, Kate, you want to jump in? Sure. How do I, I choose? Um, no, I think my what keeps me up at night the most is the extension of Rod's point and the interaction of the others, which is what happens when you have this more frequent and more intense instability at the political level, even across the world. How do our international institutions survive that? Um, and what I mean by that is how do things like migration crises or even just you know, resettlement of populations lead to ethno-nationalist responses in those societies which are, are taking in people who are adapting to their circumstances and, and moving? Um, and how do those political waves um, unseat uh, places like the European Union, places um, like our alliances with each other, our cooperation that states have at that international level. Um, and beyond that, how do the tenets of democracy, which our nation uh, rests upon and our liberal international order also rests upon, also become unseated by these impacts? Um, what does it what do we learn from the situation uh, happening with coronavirus right now, but it's always too tempting for countries to respond to very scary shocks with authoritarian responses, with um, uh, uh, responses that, that don't uphold human rights across the world and don't keep free movement of people, um, shut down, down uh, interaction and, and capitalism in order to contain the shock. And I worry that the, the democratic project is at risk. I worry that the international project, which our country has really led, um, is at risk because of climate itself.
All right, and I'm going to add one. As we look at the future and as we look at the, what the scientists project for climate change, we, we already have what I would characterize as unlivable spaces in this world. There, you don't find a lot of farming in the Antarctic or in the Sahara Desert. But what, what the science predicts is that we're going to have unlivable spaces where people currently live. We're going to have unlivable spaces in the Middle East. We're going to have um, new unlimited, uh, unlivable spaces in Africa. We're going to have new unlivable spaces in uh, South Asia. And, and so as people run out of water, as people have food insecurity, as people experience temperatures in which you cannot be outside or uh, without air conditioning for any length of time or you will die. There will be new unlivable spaces in this world and those people will have to move someplace else. And that will create a ripple effect throughout the world. And that is the four degree scenario that we're all really concerned about. That is the scenario we have to avoid. And we can avoid. That is the avoidable scenario. Will we avoid the two degree scenario? Maybe not. Will we, will we, do we have the capacity to avoid the four degree scenario? I think so. So as you read this report, you think through what is possible to avoid and what is not possible to avoid, and you hope to God that you're able to avoid the stuff that's the worst in here. Now, now that I've got you all in a good mood, um, I, the, the, our, the last part of our program, and before we finish, we have the, the great honor and benefit of having Gordon Sullivan here in the audience. And, and uh, Gordon Sullivan, as Sherry alluded to, was the chairman of that 2007 report from CNA, uh, he was the uh, 32nd, uh, I have it in my notes here, 32nd uh, Chief of Staff of the Army. It was a long time ago. He, he served as, you know, for 18 years leading the Association of the U.S. Army. Gordon Sullivan is a giant in this town, and he was one of the early people that came out and said that climate change affects national security. I was wondering, Gordon, if you might come up to the podium for just a couple minutes and uh, give some thoughts as we close out the meeting. You can tell this is not a surprise. We have a name tag for him. I feel like I've heard this song before. Um, <clears throat> 13, 14 years ago, I got a call from Sherry Goodman. <clears throat> and I hadn't talked to Sherry since we uh, were battling the deserts toward us out in the desert, the Mojave Desert, and a uh, woodpecker who was living with the Marines and the Army at uh, uh, Fort Bragg, and we were trying to get all of that under control. And the next thing she wanted to talk about was global climate change, and did I want to be on a panel? And I said, sure, whatever. I had retired <laughs> by that time. And uh, there were 12 of us all uh, flag officers, senior flag officers, not necessarily scientists, or even oriented that way. Um, and the mission was to take a look at the world and what are the, na what are the consequences of global climate change. I heard some of them here tonight, at, and I'm not surprised. The one that keeps me up at night, given my background in NATO, is what happened uh, with the mass migration and uh, the welcoming attitude of uh, the Federal Republic of Germany, which caused truly, truly chaos. Uh, a lot of people all at once and the social impact of it was huge. Uh, now, then, then if you go back down towards uh, the Balkans, coming up, uh, Hungary put up fences, uh, and you, you just keep seeing it all the way up. And uh, the extreme right in uh, the Federal Republic of Germany uh, that's something to worry about, I think. Uh, now, what we said in the report was what has been said here. Private uh, projected climate change poses a serious threat to American national security. 
uh, I could make an argument that what's going on is south to north migration, which is causing money, serious money, to be taken out of one budget where we probably could use it, defense, to build a structure. I'll let you fill in the blanks. <laughs> you know, it's America, right? Okay, so, so anyway, this, um, this is a no joke. It's a no joke phenomenon that we're faced with. Now, let me just say a couple of things. The national security consequences of climate change should be fully integrated into the national security and national defense strategies. Interestingly enough, they were. They were, and the sinks, the four stars out there around the world, were directed to put in their plans what their response is to global climate change in their area of operations. Um, when, the, when Somalia blew up, so to speak, and people started going down into Kenya and uh, very, various other places, fish started disappearing out of the ocean. And they have some of these countries in the eastern uh, part of uh, Africa have no Coast Guard. I mean, it would take rubber boats. It would take rubber coats and a couple of machine guns to police it. And I think the Coast Guard did jump in and did that. But, you know, when people are hungry, they're going after protein and fish are a source of protein nourishment to them, but they're not the Somalis' fish. They're somebody else's fish down the coast. And that causes turmoil and so forth and so on. The U.S., uh, I say this, we said it, but it didn't turn out to be that way. The U.S. should commit to a stronger national and uh, international role to help stabilize climate change at levels which would avoid significant disruption to global security and stability. I picked up the paper yesterday and right on the paper uh, in Africa we have ISIS and the Taliban. Try that one on for size. I don't mean to be a doomsayer, but this is bad stuff. Bad stuff. And, uh, so here it is, 14 years later. And the question is, is the U.S. going to leave, or are we going to stand around and watch? Because somebody has to, somebody has to operationalize this wonderful. I haven't read it, but I know because of the people who are here on this panel and what I've heard. But the question is, who's going to step forward and lead? That's my contribution to this. Okay, it takes someone to say, okay, folks, this is what we're going to do. And this is what we're going to achieve. I think you all ought to be, you all, everybody who participated, the Jackson Funds and uh, the panel and the worker bees who made it happen, because what you're doing is you are continuing a crusade. I probably shouldn't say that. Uh, so I'll come up with another word next time you hear from me. Um, at any rate, we need someone to step up and say, I'll do it. Send me. 
That's biblical, you know. Send me. You've got to find someone who can do it. Thanks. Okay, John. Thanks a lot. All right, I'm going to wrap us up. Thank you, General Sullivan. I appreciate you um, giving those remarks to close out the, the meeting and, and the thoughts for all of us here. Um, I want to thank each of you here that are here today uh, that braved the heat inside this room. Uh, and our report will be available online at www.climateandsecurity.org. Uh, finally, let me once again thank EESI for their partnership in supporting this event, the Henry M. Jackson Foundation for their support in producing the report, uh, to the entire National Security, Military, and Intelligence Panel for their work in developing the report, and to each of our speakers and to each of you. The event is now concluded. Our speakers will remain in the room for a little bit, particularly if there are any members of the media. Please feel free to engage with our panelists after the event. Thank you very much. <laughs>